I came across a story. Actually, I had read it years ago and um, had forgotten about it. And when I read it, it brought a chuckle to me. But it's about a man who um, his, his dog died. And, you know, he loved his dog. And he was just heartbroken over that over that dog dying, and so he called the pastor, and he said, Pastor, my dog died. I've had that dog a lot of years, and he was really special to me, and I want to do a funeral service for him. And I'm asking, would you preach my dog's funeral? The pastor says, oh, man, I, I, don't, do the, I don't do dogs. I, I just don't do that. I, I, I have a whole idea on, on that. Just, uh, you know, I'm sorry about your dog dying, but no. The man said, well, I'm really sorry to hear that because uh, if you did the funeral, I was going to make a $50,000 donation to the building fund. And the pastor said, well, why didn't you tell me it was a Baptist dog? (laughs) Well, that has nothing to do with my sermon this morning, but I liked it. We're looking at this idea of, of the Apostle Paul and what, what motivated him, what captured his attention uh, to be a witness. And, and let me say this, not just be a witness, but these are the things that captivated his heart to say, I want to be like him. I, I, I need God. The Apostle Paul, probably the most intelligent man of his day, but his priorities, his focus was misplaced. His religious pride overwhelmed him, and he was one who persecuted the church, who literally had Christians killed. Of course, he had this radical salvation where where God just let the light of the Holy Spirit shine down upon him, and and Paul's life was forever changed. He was Saul, and his name was changed to Paul, and he he wrote over half of our our New Testament. He was a passionate man. He was, again, highly intellectual. He, He could debate and defend the Word of God, um, had insights, church planter, uh, he, he built the church, helped the church. He, he brought correction to the church, encouraged people how to die to self and live unto Christ and how we can overcome the flesh by walking in the spirit, how we can put on the whole armor of God to stand against the, the enemy when he rushes in or when we fight him or whatever front that might be. And his passion in life was to know God and then to make him known. It's not, in, uh, it's not in your scriptures on the screen, but I want to read this to you. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians to the church at Philippi, he says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That was his, that was his passion. I want to know God. Now, it's not like he didn't know God. He had experienced God. He was saying, I want to know God in a deeper way. That word know there actually translated comes across as intimately. I want to know God in such a personal, intimate way. And he said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the defining moment for for the Christian world. Jesus lived, he died, he was buried. But if he'd have stayed buried, the cross would have had no effect. But because he rose from the dead, he destroyed death, hell, and the grave. He destroyed the enemy. And so you see through the New Testament, the resurrection and the Holy Spirit. These are driving themes for the New Testament church. The Apostle Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings like him in his death, 
that by any means possible I might attain the resurrection of the dead. I want to know God. I want, I want to resurrect from the dead. I want to go to heaven. And he goes on, and, and, and these are familiar words when he talks about, I press on. This one thing I do, I press toward the goal. This is all a part of, of, of his passion to know God and then pressing toward this prize. Now, what is this prize? What is the goal? The prize and the goal, it's obviously heaven. It's, all, it, it, it's the judgment seat of Christ that we talked about last week. It's, it's winning souls that people might come to know the Lord. And he said, if we're mature in this, we need to grab a hold of it and follow after. So what were the driving things? What caused him to say, I want to know him. I want to know him intimately. I, I want to understand, and, and I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing, I'm willing to go through whatever he has that I might know him. I want to walk like he walked. I want to be like him. This one thing I do, and I press on. <coughs> I, I'm giving it everything I've got. So to know him, to make him known. Here's, here's some of these things, and we talked about this, what motivated him in this, the judgment seat of Christ. The fact that we are all, as believers, going to stand before the Lord. I'm not going to preach this in detail. I encourage you to go back to last week and you can hear the message. And we went through greater detail and made the whole message about this judgment seat. But the judgment seat of Christ, it's also known as the Bema Seat Judgment. It's actually a rewards time. Christians, Christ followers... We get to heaven, we are not going to be judged for our sins. There is a judgment for sinners, and that is the great white throne judgment. We are rewarded for our works. And, and we're not confused into thinking that if I do good works, that I'll get rewarded. No, for by grace are you saved. It's the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. But we're created in his likeness. He follows that up. We're created in his likeness to what? To do good works. So once I know Christ, good works should follow. Let, let people see God's love in me. Let people, see, let people see the works that I do so they will glorify the Father. See, it's not about how we do in this world, all of our works and we do things to be seen and look at, and, no, this is, this is about kingdom work. Doing that which is, e, which is eternal. Two scriptures that I wanna, I wanna share with you on this. 2 Corinthians 5, verses nine and 10. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Let me stop there. Our aim. We make it our aim. This one thing I do, pressing on. Talk about a focus. His focus was to please God. His focus was to love God. His focus was to honor God. His focus was to obey. Obey God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, he, he's writing to the church at Corinth. He's telling the church, this is to believers. The believers were going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we all appear before God, and we're going to give an account of what we've done, whether good or evil. To give a little better, better understanding, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. It says, according to the grace of God given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. 
For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, let me stop there. There's only one foundation, and that is Jesus. We're not building the Island Church Kingdom. We're not building our own kingdom. We're building his kingdom, and Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, he, it's the foundation on which we build. There is no other gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are major religious groups in America and around the world who in their version of the Bible will, this statement is in every one, another gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other gospel. There's no different. It's the gospel. And that's the foundation that we build on. Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Amen? Amen? Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, so we're building on the foundation of Jesus, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. It will be revealed because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work. What kind of work was this? What was the motive in this? Was it, was it flesh? Was it the world? Was it kingdom work? It's going to be revealed. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So, this this judgment seat, we're going to be judged for our works, what sort, what was our motive, what we did. There are those that, that it's like gold and silver and precious stones, things that have been through the fire and survived the fire. And then there are other things that are like wood, hay, and stubble. It's the, it's the temporal things of this world. Now, I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. I'm not against, I'm not against God's, what I perceive God's blessing, prosperity. I'm not against your stuff. God's not against you having stuff. We are blessed in America, and, and I'm overwhelmed by that. So this isn't to say, you know, that, that I'm saying you shouldn't have a nice home or, you know, not against your truck or your motorcycle or your jet ski or your boat. Not against your hunting camp, not against, any, you think of all the things that we, that we have. It's not a message against that. Here's what I want us to know is if that is all we pour ourselves into, you got to remember how this whole thing of following God started. It started in Genesis 12, 1 and 2. And here, here's God's blessing. Here's, here's how to respond to the blessing of God. God told Abraham this. Abraham's the father of our faith. God called him out. Here's how this thing started. He said, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. I'm blessed to be a blessing. That's how the kingdom of God works. And if all we do is wood, hay, and stubble, just things, just stuff. And you know, we got, we got a lot of stuff. We have so much stuff, I miss the opportunity of a lifetime. And that is to invest or build storage units. We have so much stuff, we have to keep. And do you know they, are, they keep coming up and coming up and building and building. I still might get in on it. I don't know. Because we're, we're so enamored by, by the world and the world's view of success. And again, God's not anti. But we're consumed with Pride and greed and covetousness, lust of the eyes, lust of flesh, pride of life, comfort. Be careful of comfort. 
When you're comfortable, be careful. Comfort zones are not good. It's better to be engaged, to be in the red zone, than to be in the comfort zone. There are those that are laying up treasure in heaven. And that's what Jesus had to talk about in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20. He said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. What is treasure in heaven? You know, I, 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 can't, I can't put a truck in heaven, can't put a boat in heaven. But what, what can I put? What, how do I lay up treasure in heaven? Here, and here it is. You pour yourself into things that are eternal. Amen. And what's eternal? The Word of God is eternal. The Word of God. Heaven and earth. Here's what the Bible says. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. Amen. And then souls. Every one of us are going to live for, for eternity. Our soul will live forever. And either we'll live in heaven or we'll live in hell. But our souls live forever. That's, that's why the Apostle Paul said, listen, there's a reward. There, there's a reward here. I, I just want, when I stand before God, I don't want to be embarrassed. You know, it says here that, that there'll be people that'll suffer loss because they're not going to have anything. They, they didn't invest in kingdom. They look around and everything that they were involved in was gone up in, in, in flames. It says they'll be saved. Remember, it's like the house on fire. You got all of your savings. You don't believe in banks. You got all your savings, got all your money, your family, everything. In the house, it catches on fire. Everything's being destroyed. You can't get anyone or anything out. You get out, but your house, your family, and everything you've ever owned is destroyed. And that's what it'll be like. That's why I say, bring your family to heaven with you. Dad, Live your life and lead your son to love God, know God, and follow after him. You say, well, I've messed up. You know what? God can change you wherever you're at. Amen. Get on track. Mom, live for God. Honor God. Teach your children to follow after the things of God. Amen. Amen. Souls. He that went of souls, the Bible says, is wise. The Apostle Paul said, I'm, I'm going to stand before God. And can I tell you this? I don't think it was just like, look at my reward. Because does everyone realize this? We'll receive a reward. Some will suffer loss. I don't know how God's going to work all that out. But he says, we'll suffer loss. Those that didn't, didn't. There's a destroyed by the fire. But God, help me. Help me. The whole, the whole thing of this, I get a reward. When we worship God, what's going to happen? We're going to throw our rewards. We're going to cast our crowns down at his feet. Because there's only one that's worthy. I just want to have something to throw down at his feet. I want to have something to give him. That all the work, all the things that we've done, we did for his, to please him. We aim to please him. Amen. Amen. Here, here's the next thing I, I want us to look at in this. It, and there's so much about the judgment seat of Christ and reward. And again, we, we spoke on quite a bit of it last week. But you can take a listen the second thing is, is the fear, the fear of the Lord. What, what caused the Apostle Paul to be a witness? What caused him to say, I want to know you, this one thing I do? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. 
the, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. The fear of the Lord. Some of the older translations uses this, uses this word. I, looked, I was looking it up yesterday, and I thought, I wonder if this is in my new King James Bible. When it, it was, it's, it's called the terror, the terror of the Lord. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade, we persuade others. Do you, do you recognize do you recognize that God is a, a God of love and he's also a God of judgment? The Bible says the fear, the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. That, that word fear, it's this sense of awe. It's not that we're scared of God, but there's this sense of awe and respect and honor The terror of the Lord. I honor God. I respect him because I understand that there are consequences. See, we live in a world that doesn't want consequences. I talked to kids this week. I I use this statement about every week, the opportunity that I have to, to speak, is you can make any decision you want. You're just not free to choose the consequence. And people, people want to do whatever they want without, without any consequence. You know, I loved my dad. Um, you, would have, you would have loved my dad. He was an amazing guy. He had a radical salvation as a young adult. He was athletic. He was competitive. He, he, competitive doesn't even describe what he was. He, he was the epitome of, of, I'm not going to beat you, son. I'm going to destroy you in this ping pong game. And then Liz wants me to let the kids win. And I'm like, no, they're not winning. My dad never let me win. He was fun. He was funny. Uh, loved to laugh. Incredible communicator of the Word of God. Um, he was in my life. He was at every game. Uh, coaches always had my dad come in the locker room and pray before the game. And they used to have prayer before football games. My dad prayed before all the football games. He came to the school. Twice a year, they had him come to the school and do what they called character building assemblies for the whole school. So, I mean, he was in my life. I was a student council president, and I'd say, well, it was really great to have my dad. And I was just hoping, God, help him not embarrass me today in front of all my friends. But I, I was fearful of my dad. I didn't cower. He is a lover. Man, he'd grab you, wrestle you. Give you a kiss on the cheek. He, 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 he would roughhouse and play and love. But he had lines, and if you cross that line, there was no negotiation. I grew up in a house that grounding, I, he'd never heard of it. I wish he'd have heard of grounding, but he had never heard of that. He had another way that he enforced his, his rule. And, and if you crossed it, you were going to get it. I loved him. I respected him. I feared. And that kept me from going across the line many times in my life because I knew the consequence. Do you see with God? God has lines. You cannot preach the love of God to the exclusion of his judgment. He has lines. I used to tell my kids when they were, they were younger, I'd say, 
Listen, guys, I have the power to bless you, and I have the power to make your life miserable. (laughs) If you cross the line, we got to have some parameters here. See, when he talks about the fear of the Lord, think, think about this. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning. Everybody, everybody say beginning. beginning. That's it, beginning of wisdom. And I know this, you break it down, it stings a little bit, but it, me, it means this. It means you don't have a lick of sense if you don't fear God. Because it's the beginning. It's where it starts. We live in a society that doesn't fear God. And as a result, the structure of the home, structure of society, the rule of law, it breaks down because there is no fear. But the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of all wisdom. The apostle Paul understood God's a God of love, but God is a God of justice. He understood that the Bible says God is angry with the wicked. Psalm, one, Psalm 11, 5, and Psalm 5 and verse 5. That God's a God of judgment. Ezekiel 18, he understood that if we live a life of sin, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Psalm 9, the wicked shall be turned to hell and every nation that forgets God. And, and so, recognizing there's some, there's these incredible consequence for walking and living outside relationship with God, it compelled him, the fear of the Lord. In our world, people think heaven's a myth and, and that hell is not real. That people... People don't believe in a literal hell. They believe that it's, it's a fairy tale. Listen, if, if hell is a fairy tale, heaven's a myth, then your Bible is the biggest lie that's ever been written because your Bible is full of information anointed by the Holy Spirit concerning eternity, concerning heaven, and concerning hell. Jesus warned about hell. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. It says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. Uh, He wasn't telling us to cut our hand off or to pluck our eye out. He was giving an over-the-top illustration of how much you don't want to go there. That you want to stay, that you want to stay away. A figure of speech to say, this thing is so horrible, it'd be better It'd be better to go to heaven, halt lame and blind, than to go to hell whole. I think of this, people say, well, it's, it's just uh, hyperbole. It's a figure of, of speech. It's a metaphor, rather. But <laughs> number one, we don't have a right to give our own interpretation of that. But let's say, let's say that, that it is just a figure of speech. The symbol is always weaker than the reality. The, the painting of the sunset is never as beautiful as the sunset itself when you see it. And if God chose fire to symbolize reality of hell, do you really want to go there? 
And so Paul says, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the terror of the Lord. Now understand something. I want everybody to listen real good. I want us to have a, a good balance and understanding. I don't talk in, when I have opportunity, common ground, make a transition, talk about Jesus. It's not about you're going to hell. I never say that. I don't use hell as a way to try to scare people into the kingdom of God. Hell is a great motivation for me to win people into the kingdom of God. You know, I grew up in that latter part of the Jesus movement when, you know, street ministry was huge and it was, you know, turn or burn, you're headed straight to hell. Well, I'm, I'm not as much, and I don't think that's the best way to tell people about the Lord. But what motivates me is the fact that hell is a reality. And people want to talk about it, I'll talk about it. But here's the bottom line is it is real, and we have family and friends, and there are multitudes of people in the world that are headed there if we or someone doesn't witness to them and lead them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so it's a motivation for me. It motivated, it motivated Paul, I, I understand talking about hell this morning. I, I under, church growth specialist would, I'm flunking the church growth class right now. Uh, psychologists, sociologists, scholars, it, it's not good to preach about hell, and especially on a, on a Sunday morning. Abraham Lincoln was talking to a little boy one day, and he asked the little boy, he said, he said, if a dog has four legs and, uh, and we call its tail a leg, how many legs does that dog have? The little boy said, five. Abraham Lincoln told him, said, no, son, he still has four. You can call his tail a leg, but it's still a tail. Well, listen. It doesn't matter what people say about hell, it's still real. It's still in the Word of God. And God helped me to win as many people, to win as many people. God, let it motivate. May it, may it, may it be a reality that I have a job to do. Amen? Amen. Anybody still with me? Amen? How about this, the love of Christ? The love of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Interesting, all these things to the Corinthians, the church he's talking about this. He said, if we're beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Some translation says the love of Christ constrains us. Because we have concluded this. That one has died for all, therefore all have died. And if he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but live for him who for their sake he died and was raised. The love of Christ. So that those who don't know might know that they might experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love, I love God. I, I love God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You hear me use this expression, but it's, it's true. I get it. He did for me what I couldn't do for myself. I, I can't talk my way, pay my way. I can't relieve my own guilt, my own condemnation. I can't overcome my own fears and insecurities. He did for me. The blood of Jesus not only covers me. I'm not just covered. I'm cleansed. 
I'm a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. I love him. John said it this way. I love him because he first loved me. <clears throat> Listen, it, it's not that I was reaching out to him. People always talk about, I was looking for God. No, no, no. <laughs> if we are, it's his grace. All through scripture, God's looking for man. He came to seek and save. Jesus came from heaven. The incarnation, the virgin birth, sinless life. Why? He came to mankind to identify with me. We have one in heaven who knows what it's like to live in these earthly bodies. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. The whole emphasis of, of, of Jesus coming, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He so loved, he gave Jesus. See, what is my purpose in life? My purpose is to know him, love him, and then to make him known. In my home, in my sphere of influence, my work, my community, it's to know him and to make, and to make him known. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, he said this, follow me and I will, I've been preaching it a month, folks, so help me, <laughs> help me a little bit. Follow me and I will, fishers of men. Got your fishing license? Follow me and I'll make you, that was his call, that you said call of salvation, it was the, his call to them to follow, he was going to, there was his disciples, people he was going to pour his life into because he was going to ascend to heaven. These were going to be people that would lead the church, but he didn't say, follow me, I'm going to make you the leader of the church, I'm going to make you the pastor, I'm going to teach you how to be successful, I'm going to teach you how to get rich. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. To the same group of guys, he says over here, right before his feet leave the earth, you'll receive power and you'll be a witness. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the whole, the whole earth. And so, he loves us. He loves us. What does he ask? He just wants us to love him back. Surrender our life and love him back. The Bible says this in Psalm 107 in verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Anybody here saved? Anybody here full of the Spirit of God? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen? Can't help but talk about it. Here's, here's the next thing. Let, let me wind this down. Change lives. What motivated the Apostle Paul to tell others to live for God? It's in 2 Corinthians 5. I'm going to skip down in reading to verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen? Amen. Now watch this. And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting us the message of reconciliation. He made us a new creation so we could be ministers of reconciliation, so we could see people reconciled to God their Father. Radical change. And it's tied to, we have a job. Anybody hear a difference since Jesus came into your life? Anybody think, man, I was, I was pretty messed up. I, I, I was, you know, we have folks as drugs, alcohol, bound, testimonies, skeletons, all the things. They receive Jesus Christ and they're a new creation. Not even a resemblance of the same. Anybody here been changed, went from darkness to light? Anybody? Death to life, amen? The Apostle Paul radically changed. He had been killing people, radically changed. And then here's uh, the last, last thing I want you to see is this is our life assignment. 
2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. Verse 18 again, he's given us this ministry of reconciliation. I want you to look at verse 20. It says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we're ambassadors and we're imploring people, be reconciled, come to know God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In the world, the United States has ambassadors in countries all around the world. And that ambassador represents the United States in that country. And that's what God's called us to do. This world, he's made us to be his ambassadors, and we represent Christ to this lost world. It's, it's our life's calling. He saved us. He loved me. He changed me. It's now my calling. God, captivate, captivate my heart. Help me to see. This is not, not just Pastor Fred's job. It's not just, you know, the pastor's job. It's not just someone who, man, they've got a gift of evangelism. No, it's our responsibility. You know, people, they want the world to change. They want, they want Washington to change. And, and again, I come back to this. We're professional gripers when it comes to what's happening politically in the world. The answer is this. The answer is if all of us reach one person and we and we taught them, we discipled them, and taught them the Romans road, and, and shared with them. And that person reached one person, and then that person reached one person. There would be exponentially, it would move across this nation, around this world. That's the answer, Jesus changing new creation. Amen. We can sit and gripe, or we can get in on God's plan and have revival. Amen. We think revival's a feeling that we have, Oh, I got, I got doodads. I got goosebumps. Come on now. No, no, no. Revival's about people being revived from the dead and brought alive in Jesus Christ. That's what will change this world. Anybody with me? Amen. Amen. Do this with me. Ask God to give you a burden for souls. Lord, make this a part of your daily prayer. Lord, help me to win a soul today. I can remember as a kid, my dad would say on a lot of Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, now tomorrow, when you go to work, the first person you see, I want you to witness to them. How many of you will do that? And man, people did it. And that's fine. But I'm going to tell you, when you pray, God help me win a soul, God will bring about a divine appointment in that day. And it will be so natural. You know why? Common ground, make a transition, talk about Jesus. Amen. So Lord, help me to win a soul. Every day, pray this, fill me with your, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, which leads to dissipation, but be continually filled with the Spirit. Let me just ask you a question. How does somebody stay drunk? They keep drinking. Okay? That's in the natural. How does someone stay full of the Holy Spirit? They keep being filled. They keep saying, Lord, fill me. I want everything you have. Fill me with your Spirit. Be continually filled. Be continually filled with his spirit. I pray it every day. Lord, fill me with your spirit today. Let me walk in the spirit. And then this. Please. 
I, I beg you, implore you. I don't know. I don't have, I don't have a good enough vocabulary to plead with you to say, read this. Read this. Read it. I heard a pastor this week, and he uh, quoted a study on the effects of reading the Bible by the Institute for Biblical Research, and it was about the effects of reading the Bible and how often people read the Bible, whether it's once a week, twice, two, three, four times a week. In this study, here's what he, he conveyed, that people who read the Bible one day a week that it really has no, no effect on the way they live their life. But if someone will read the Bible two or three days a week, it has some effect. But then he made this statement. He said if someone would cross the Rubicon and read the Bible at least four days a week, that person is 228% more likely to share their faith. 407% more likely to memorize Scripture, 59% less likely to view pornography, and at least 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness, depression, and anxiety. He said the big idea is this. When the Word, not the world, becomes the majority of your week, your life will start to change. I think if we'll pray and ask God to give us souls and we'll stay full of his spirit and we'll be consumed with his word, God, use me. Use me. Lord, I, I, I see it. I see it in your word, your love, your change, the fear of the Lord. God, these things, to be more like you, to know you, and to help others come to know you. Amen? I'm so glad you joined us today for Island Church Online. If you made a decision in your heart to follow Christ today, please let us know. You can text the word NEXT to 251-244-2030, where we'll send you some free digital resources and get you started in your journey of faith in Christ. This also gives us an opportunity to celebrate with you and pray for you. To give toward the ministry of this house, go to the islandchurch.tv slash give. Your gifts are what make this possible. We're so glad that you made the Island Church your home for Sunday worship today. And my prayer is that your year will be full of God's grace and blessings as you follow after him. Oh, 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 oh,